Thank you, everyone. Um, today we're talking about TDD. Uh, who know what's TDD? Please raise your hands. Okay, almost everyone is good. Keep your hand uh, raised if you use TDD. Okay, and who is seriously TDD uh, for his work? Very few. Okay, thanks. Um, so, I work with Rust uh, for three years and half of that time without TDD. Um, and TDD changed how I write Rust. Um, that's what I want to share. Um, I would be happy, it's my goal, if at the end of this talk you would like to try TDD or try again for your project, um, I will show you a way that works for me and I think it's efficient. So uh, a bit about me. Uh, by night, I'm, I do open source, not like the, the big guys uh, before me and after me, uh, just a little. Uh, you can find me uh, at Twitter on uh, GitHub at MacWeek and uh, shoot me a mail. I take all feedback, that's what well. And by day, I'm a consultant at Octo Technology, which is a consultant firm uh, specialized in software craftsmanship. Um, we are like two or three hundred in Paris and like 30 in Lausanne, so it's a little team in Swiss. Um, I have good news. Uh, I have books. <laughs> <laughs> so, we are really passionate about uh, quality code and software craftsmanship at Octo, and we wrote a white paper about that. Uh, so, there is a part about GDD, and my talk is, uh, I have to say, uh, inspired from this book. Uh, there's a lot more, like uh, tech leading, maintaining quality, and um, reducing bug in the long run. Uh, these books are free, uh, and uh, I will give them away uh, if you want at the end of this talk. The thing, though, it's it French. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the end, you, there is a Google form when you can uh, ask to a translation, for a translation. Uh, translation will be uh, not free, but like $20, I don't think. I think something like that. So just uh, click the link, say, hey, I want that, uh, I want one, and I'll, we will notify you when it's translated. Um, yeah, uh, slides are online, uh, check them out. Uh, for now, speakers not are uh, private, but uh, I will make them public. Uh, everything I say are written in the, the, the speaker's notes, so it's uh, self-containing uh, uh, with reference link uh, to, to what I'm saying. And uh, yeah, this link. So, TDD. Um, the TDD means test driven development. Everyone knows that, that's good. When uh, we say tests, um, there is three kinds of tests. There is unit testing, Integration testing and functional testing. Uh, I won't speak about the latter two. I'm only speaking about unit testing here because um, when we do TDD, it's more unit tests that we want. A question uh, I got asked a lot from my clients uh, is, uh, why do you test first? Uh, that's strange. I tend to do my work first and check later. And that's a good question. Uh, personally, I have five reasons why I test first. The first set, it's simply easier. Um, when you write your code, then you write your test, it's a kind of fuzzy. You don't know how many tests do I do for this kind of code, where, where do I put it, uh, how do I name them. It's hard to write. It's really much easier to just do the test first and say, yes, this is the behavior I want to test, this is what I want to do. I write the test and I do the rest. This is my opinion again. Another reason is, um, you want to test the intent. When I said I want to test this behavior, you want to test the logic. You don't want to test the syntax, or you don't want to test specific implementation. You want to test um, construction of your, of your code. Uh, your code is here to, to, to add value to someone, and this is the intent. You can also say that um, testing first helps in your design, because uh, you have not wrote any code yet. You are just calling your function. Um, you say, what will be its name? What parameters does it take? Uh, how, how does it fit uh, in your whole system? As we didn't wrote any code, we can change it as we want. So 
it's really easy uh, to design things uh, when we don't have code, actually. <laughs> um, I'm not a particularly good programmer. Um, usually I think, uh, yeah, I understood that. Uh, let's go. Let's do that. And then it doesn't work. Tests help me uh, to challenge my understanding of the system because uh, when I have to write the test and use my function and use the other parts of the code that use uh, what I want to test, I can see that, hey, this doesn't implement sync. This is not clonable. I can't do the things like that. So I, I, when I test first, I better understand and understand better uh, what I am doing. Uh, final thing is... Uh, my boss is happy because this is a specification we have written. Uh, and you can go one year later and see, hey, this is this behavior, this specific bug, this is how it should be, um, be taken care of by specification. That's, uh, that's really helpful when, uh, when, the, when you, you have to come back later on the code. So there's five reasons. It's easier. Uh, I want to test the intent of what I'm doing and not the code it says of the implementation. It tests my design, it challenges my understanding, and it's an executable specification. Really useful. Uh, maybe you'll say, yeah, it's good, but uh, what's your return on, the invest or, ooh, on investment? Sorry. And uh, it seems like people have written about that, so I made links at the end of the talk that you can uh, see later and maybe share if you need to argue. And that's all about uh, TDD. No, <laughs> that's not all. How does it work? Um, what I will show you now is something that I do uh, because it works for me. There are many things that don't work, um, and I won't speak about that. Uh, you, you can uh, uh, miss a step and be stuck in a cycle. So when I speak about cycles, uh, this is red, green refactor, the three steps of TD. Um, and we cycle between them in a tight feedback loop. The idea is to make micro step. So the, grand f the red phase is um, you write a test. So you have to ask yourself, what do I want to test? What do I do next that I want to, to, to go forward? Uh, this is uh, the first step of the cycle. So this is the one which will drive your cycle. We'll see later uh, about the next step. The next test. Um, you, so you write your, your test. Uh, it's a dumb test, uh, normally. And you make it pass in a dumb way. Um, that's, that's easy. You, you just see what the assertion is, and you make it pass in the dumb and simple way. The addition of red tests uh, make it less and less dumb and more and more smart. And then you take a step back. You're looking at the code and you say, oh, wh what can I refactor in my code? This is a refactoring step. You don't have to overdo it, because you, you'll do it again in the next cycle. Uh, that's very really comforting. So you cycle back again and again and again uh, with little steps, with little increments. So when I said uh, in the red step, you're driving your cycle, and you have to choose your next step. And how do you choose your next step? Um, you have to think about something small, that you can do fast, uh, that you can quickly uh, pass, that makes you go forward, and most important at all, that you don't already have code. Uh, it's not so easy. It's a muscle to train. So we'll do, we'll do a quick example. Um, very simple. Let's say I want to implement, uh, I don't know, um, a divisor, and I want to, so I want to, to make the divide function. It's very easy. It's only to show the methodology. So if you want to do a function, if you want to, to make function, just call it in your test. It doesn't exist. That's not bad. Um, because when you do that, you have to think about um, where do I put my function or do I name it? Um, that's a good start. So you have probably this error. No, association, no function or associated item named divide. Maybe it's Divisor, I don't know, depends on your code. Uh, the green step is very easy. You just declare the function with a signature and maybe filling the, the blanks. So it passes, that's great. There's nothing to refactor, so we can move on. And then we want our function to do something. So what's the easiest thing we can do that we don't do? It's easy, we don't do anything. Um, we can 
put in your tests. Here, I made division by zero, because um, this is an error case. The error case, uh, actually, is quite simple. I only have to, to put an error in the return. But look, what did we do just there? We made a call where we choose our parameters, and what kind of return will be done? Here is the result. And then I had to adapt my signature, uh, choose my type, so here it's U32. Uh, it could be U size, I don't know. It depends on, on your choice. Um, it's a little uh, advanced, but first time we say, what will be my function? How do I name it? Where do I put it? The second time is, what will be the signature? It's type I, I, will, you know, I want to use. And you can see, I didn't complete with the types of the results. Results are just unit types. It's because, yeah, we can make tests later to assert that and specify that. And then, uh, to make the test pass, uh, I also have to change my first test. That's not bad. It's only micro steps, micro advance. Again, there's nothing to reflect on. Um, you're going on and going on and going on. Then you can divide by one, then divide by two, then say, OK, I know how to use my function. How does it write? Maybe I can make none plus infinity minus infinity plus zero minus zero. You, you, you made all the little steps, and then you're happy, and then your code works, and it's fully specified. That's very neat. I like TDD. So, next step. The next test, simply a muscle to train. Uh, that's the hard thing about TDD. Uh, you can just enumerate uh, behavior, use case, which are just variants, just simply the same, and so you don't go forward. Or you can just go make a, a, a step up too big, and then your feedback loop is too large. You, you are deep in your code to make your test pass, but your test is too big. Just cut it in little pieces. Um, so you have to slow down. Uh, that's the hard thing. But when you slow down, you just uh, look at the details. You take your time to, to do things right. And so you don't have to, you don't have to look back. Um, you, you can advance in a steady way. Um, What's nice with Rust is that you already have cargo tests, and you don't need anything to test your function. Uh, there is assert, there is a good test runner. You can start now. It's really easy. So, let's say about general tips and remarks uh, in TDD in Rust. There is no null. Uh, it's obvious. Yeah, uh, Rust doesn't like nudes. It's preferred monads with optional results. Um, but also. Rust is uh, very hard to make it uh, compile. You have ready to, to prove to your compiler the, that it works. Only for the nominal case, the right case, for all the error branches, you can just clone your, your states. You can just uh, make hard-coded uh, error status. It's very easy to handle the error case. So you don't have null. We have OK on error. We have some unknown. And None on error are very easy to just handle. So you just begin to handle the error cases. And your code, it begins stronger, because you, you just do all the error. And then when you have done all the error, the nominal case is really easy to, to do, to code. Uh, maybe you know error chain, which is like uh, quick error plus plus. Uh, I like this crate a lot, uh, especially the bail macro. Uh, so you can just bail with a, a quick string, and uh, later, when you want to test uh, the error return, you can put a test and put your error kind, and that's all. Very nice, very easy. Yeah. Uh, when you do TDD, you tend to have a lot, a lot of tests. Um, so when I have like 200 lines of code uh, for 2,000 lines of tests, which is a lot, but classic. Uh, it's hard to navigate in the file. Uh, so I tend to split the file into uh, the module, which is, will be like tasks, and the uh, task underscore test, where all the tests will be. Um, in terms of visibility uh, in the crates, that's not tip top, but it works. Uh, it's also fine. And so you can have a split uh, with the true files. Uh, I like that. 
Integration testing is in the test directory uh, as uh, advised in the cargo guide. And uh, there is functional testing on, which you can put in your documentation on examples directory. Uh, so when you do cargo test, it will test these documentation examples. It will test the examples directory. You know that you, the things that you want to show to your user, the thing uh, or you want to, to design your API, uh, you can just put it in the test, an example that will be tested. That's it's very handy. Um, if you know double loop TD, you can do that with an example. Uh, I like that a lot also. Um, if you have ever done uh, Ruby, you have our spec where we tend to use describe um, to for uh, your type hierarchy. You might describe your class, then describe your function, then specify your context with uh, given cases. Uh, I tend to repeat the same pattern in Rust. Uh, so when I do cargo tests, the error is more readable. And then you can collapse uh, all the parts of the code and directly go where you want to go. So here you have, I think, up, you have uh, your module, which is just a struct I want to test. And Resolve include, as name and is templated, are uh, functions of these structs. Uh, in the, inside this module, which, uh, which has the name of the function, I just put the test which describes the function. Just a way to, to group your tests. Uh, so you, you, don't, uh, you can easily navigate between them. There is a lot of them. Uh, maybe you have noticed this pub use super colon colon star. Uh, I won't explain it in detail. Uh, also, this may be changed in the future with the ergonomic initiative, but uh, it permits to use this in all the modules which are included and then publish them to the child module. So you, you just pub you do your pub use as a root and all the inside module will have the same uh, use. Um, it's like uh, dry for imports. Speaking of dry, uh, please do repeat yourself in your tests. Uh, we just have seen some talks about macros. They are not the most readable things ever. Um, errors are even less readable. And when your tests fail, you don't want to pass time to decipher what you just wrote one year later. You want to just see the tests. You want a good bug report. Uh, where there is a clear error, a clear path to this error, and a clear, what, this is what I expected, and this is what I got, and this don't match. Macros don't tend to, to give us that. Uh, also, setup functions and teardown functions usually um, don't give that also. Just do it simply. You have a function, your test function, you have the arrange part, the act, where you do the thing, the assert when you test the thing. You must not test too many things. You must not do too many things you arrange. This is a little test. Keep it simple. This keep it readable. And most important of all, a failing test should be a complete and explicit bug report. Think of that when you write your test. If the test fails, is it enough for me to debug my code? So. Um, Speaking of setup of teardown function, usually, no, in Rust, we don't have mocks, we don't have stubs, we don't have introspection uh, at runtime, time, we don't have uh, this, kind of, this kind of things. So setup on teardown is strictly limited to putting singletons, filling the databases, or creating files in the file system. This is not unit test. This is integration testing. Sometimes it's fine. But most probably, you don't need it. And most probably, this is your unit tests uh, don't need it. And you can be reduced to the scope of what you're testing. This is really the hard part. Um, if you want Google Trans Code Translated, here is a Google form. Like I said, I work at Octo Technology. Uh, if you're interested in software craftsmanship, you can shoot me a mail. I'm Thomas Wickham. Or uh, working Swiss with uh, TH Info or Joseph will be happy to answer a question. Um, I know that you want to eat, so I make it quick. 
And this is a return to the end of the talk. Uh, TDD is about self-improvement. Uh, you know that your design is not perfect. You know that you didn't handle all the cases. Uh, but you know where you didn't handle the cases and where the design is not good. And you know where it's good and where it handles the cases. This is why I like TDD. This is why I tend to use TDD whenever I can, every day in my work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thomas. We have a few more minutes for questions. A short question. How do you deal with code that does some kind of I.O. Uh, in a TDD fashion? Excuse me, I'm not sure I understood. Uh, how, how do you deal with code that does some I.O., like input-output, like, for example, communicating with Zookeeper or something like that? How do you test uh, code like that uh, using test-driven development? Um, so let me reformulate your question. You are saying, can my test call other uh, external dependencies? Uh, yes, or in general, doing any kind of uh, I.O., basically. Yeah, I.O., okay, sorry. Uh, so sometimes you don't have any choice, but I.O. usually is integration testing. Uh, if you can uh, abstract from I.O., that's best. Uh, there is a, the bikeshed.fm podcast, uh, which is very nice with uh, Shane Griffin. We spoke sometimes about uh, his problem with uh, S3 API and Stripe API, where he can't uh, call them because his, this will create files or make payments. Um, uh, he said, yeah, I don't have any choice. I, I have to mock them. But um, you can't mock in Rust. So what you do uh, is generosity and you, you make a template of your, uh, of your function with a stub thing uh, inside. That's not good. Uh, well, there is a way of TDD which uh, uh, is named the mockist TDD. We do that a lot, uh, but in Rust it's harder to do. So I won't recommend you to use mock uh, for IO. And uh, I recommend you to give your state to a function. This function returns another state and the I.O. kind uh, is separated, extracted, and not tested. Okay, we have another question over there. Uh, the mic is off. Mic is off. Okay. Oh, yeah, now... <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, so my question is kind of similar. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever done any integration testing with Rust because for me that really was always kind of annoying because you have all the types and so on and really what you just want to write, especially for like a web API, is just like look at the status code but you end up having to build JSON objects and so on. Um, yeah, maybe uh, is there a way to do, that, to do that with other languages? Like maybe you could script it in Python. Have you ever considered that? Um. Could you shorten your question a bit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, can you integration test using other languages? Are there smart ways to do that with Rust? Like you want to yeah. view your errors and yeah. so on? Yeah. Uh, by definition, integration testing integrates with other thing, which can be Python, which can be Node, which can be any other thing. Uh, the risk there is that when you do coupling like that, you have to be very clear of... Uh, what are your assumptions of the other system? Uh, for example, maybe the, the Python you are calling is not the same version or has not the same syst uh, system dependencies, and so which can pass uh, in a system, won't in another. Uh, this is the risk with integration testing. Usually it's quite fragile because it works here but not there. Does it really answer your question? Uh, yeah, I was also asking, like, in a technical way, catching your Rust errors and so on, actually displaying them, are there ways to have test suites that then work? Uh, for example, if you're using, like, web frameworks and so on. Um, I don't think there exists anything for that yet, but I'm asking if maybe you do know about anything. 
if I have made integration testing with race? Sorry, sorry. I, I don't understand your question, sorry. Okay. Um, that's all right. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Hi. I, um, I was wondering, when, you, when you're doing test-driven development, do you have to turn off um, any real-time linting? Because I know if I start mentioning functions that don't exist yet, my editor just gets full of angry red text. Sorry, I did. so do you do you use runtime run linting? Do you get real time linting in your yeah. editor, or do you have to disable it? But yes, but I don't see. Yeah, yes, of course, you should do linting. Linting is very good. Yeah. <laughs> How do you deal with your editor during that time? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't see the issue here actually. Um, it's right. Yeah, you pass your tests. Uh, the, the, the feedback loop is quite short. Um, the linting helps you uh, by giving you errors. So you just, okay, this is the first error, then there is the next, and there is the next, and you, you go forward like that. Uh, linting is not an issue here, it just helps you. Uh, when it, uh, it, it says to you it's not the right type, uh, you have to decide if the type you made in the signature is not so good, or if the type you made in your test is not good. It's only here, there is a decision to take. What will we do? Okay. 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 One more question over there. You just walk off the stairs. Uh, yeah, cutting corners by leaving out a parameter or, um, you know, mocking module imports or, or stuff like that. Um, you know, Rust is a lot more fussy and won't let you do stuff like that. Do you find it more difficult to write unit tests in Rust? Do I find what? what more difficult to write ah, unit tests. Ah, what do tests? I find difficult? Um, I come from the Ruby world, but I have also done a lot of JavaScript testing. Um, uh, in Ruby and JavaScript both, it's far more easier to go forward to the what I want and then work out the errors. And you usually forget errors. Uh, in Rust, as the error is easier to, to handle, uh, I just do all the errors okay, I can think of. And then uh, I have references, I have um, basic type system, and the, the, the nominal curse is far easier to handle. This is difficult. Uh, it's you invest your, your, your flow of thought about that. Uh, another thing uh, difficult is like uh, don't use reference where you're not sure you want a reference because uh, the refactoring can be quite a hassle. Um, um, large refactoring in Rust can be really painful because uh, you have to juggle between the files and uh, like is this module or directory or file uh, so you're switching between them until you're happy um, this is a lot of changes uh, compared to JavaScript or Java where you we can just extract method and play with that now okay we have one more question over here so in production code um, if I see repetition, sorry, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> um, in my production code, if I see repetition, I refactor it away. And don't repeat yourself is really important. What is it that's different about test code that means that you think that repetition is good? In production code, excuse me, could you tell me your... <laughs> you sorry. said that dry is yeah. not applicable for test yeah. code, and that surprises me. Yeah. Can you... Explain some more. Explain a little more. Okay. Um, when I first uh, did TDD uh, in Rust, um, I saw a lot of uh, factorization opportunities in my tests. So, actually, kind of always the same 
music uh, everywhere. So you can make macro for that. You can make a lot and lots of macro. But there, you introduce coupling between uh, different parts of tests that are similar, but don't do the same thing. Uh, and this coupling also uh, blur your errors. So it's not like you can't do this. You can do this, and sometimes it's fine. It's just that uh, you don't want to spend half an hour just understand your tests and what gone bad. Uh, you just want to see your tests and read it and say, okay, this is the error, this is what I want to fix. Uh, maybe you have macros in your code, uh, not your tests, and the tests uh, which are not, uh, don't use macro, will be greatly easier uh, to read and understand what went wrong in the macro. This is the difference for me. So is it mainly macros that are the problem? Um, yes, I think macro is the main problem, but uh, stubs uh, with generosity. Uh, so if you want to stub something in Rust, uh, you have to m put your function, uh, the stem under test, you have to template it. Uh, so and have a common trait between what you want to use and your stub. And this introduces a lot of visual noise. Uh, so maybe you are just reading the code and you have template everywhere. And why do I have template? I don't use this template in my code. This is another struggle. OK, thanks. Thank you. So sadly, we're out of time for questions, but we covered a lot, I think. And thank you, Thomas, for this amazing talk. Thank you, everyone. Uh,